Hello and welcome to our latest edition of the Inspiring Science Education Hangouts. Um, my name is Dr. Pamela Gay and I'm going to be your host for not just this episode but for this series. So please tune in every second Wednesday and sometimes on the fourth Wednesday of the month to learn more about uh, how you can help your kids better understand this universe that we share. Uh, in this live series of events and training videos, we'll be presenting timeless astronomy education materials designed to help l students learn science through inquiry. Um, one of the fundamental questions that is asked not just by children, but by adults, philosophers, scientists, is where do we come from? Uh, well, the ultimate answer is beyond the scope of not just this hangout, but current science and lies more in the realm of philosophers and poets. Science can ask and answer the question, where did our solar system come from? And where did other solar systems come from after the Big Bang? Uh, this is something that we're going to explore throughout this hangout and we're going to try and help you understand how it is that we understand not just how our solar system came to be but how solar systems in general uh, have formed, how they're evolving and in some cases how they might even die. As a starting point, um, remember that our universe pretty much started out as a fog of particles. Uh, there were slight variations in density that allowed everything that we see today to form. And some of those areas with a little bit extra matter, those are the places that formed the stars, the galaxies, the large-scale structure of our universe. In this hangout, we're going to discuss how Early, uh, we're not going to discuss so much that early structure formation, but rather we're going to fast forward to the star formation that we see throughout our current universe. Um, this is a one-hour event that is designed to bring you uh, not just educational tools, but also the latest science. And joining us for the beginning of this event uh, is going to be uh, Joran Pilbrat, who uh, comes to us from the Herschel mission. And uh, we're going to uh, ask you to share with us any questions that you may have using the Q&A app throughout this show. Um, we're going to have Joran uh, discussing um, all of the latest events, or latest discoveries, rather. And um, if you have questions based on what you hear he or I uh, discussing, uh, type those in. You can find the Q&A app in any of the live uh, videos windows in which you're watching this Hangout. Just click on the yellow Q&A button. And if you see another question that you really like, click the plus one and I'll see those questions rise to the surface. I can already see that we have a bunch of people out there, uh, Nancy Graziano, Peter Waldman, um, and many others. So thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. And thank you, Joran, for coming to us uh, from the Netherlands and joining us for this Hangout. Um, Welcome, and uh, I guess to get things started, I'm going to ask you how the universe got things started. Can you give us the broadest of overviews uh, on how we went from having clouds of gas and dust to the planets that we live on today? Okay, Pamela, thank you. Um, well, stars and... Uh, planetary systems form in molecular clouds in, uh, in our galaxy and other galaxies. Now these clouds are clouds of uh, gas and a little bit of dust, typically about a percent or so of dust by, uh, by mass. And uh, these clouds are part of what we generally call interstellar matter. So that's the matter between the stars in the galaxy. Now when the stars form, they uh, are first tenuous, but as they, as they build up matter and become um, more massive, they kind of shield themselves against the radiation from the st surrounding stars. And that means that they cool off. So the interior of these clouds get very cold, and when we, when, when, when we say very cold, we mean like 10, 20 Kelvin, 10 or 20 degrees above the absolute zero. 
Um, and that means that they also become molecular. So the hydrogen, which is most of what's in there, becomes molecular hydrogen. That's why these clouds are called molecular clouds. Now, when, when, so stars form from cold molecular gas in these clouds. And when it gets, um, when it gets massive enough, uh, the density gets high enough, they basically, uh, they can under certain conditions collapse because not all clouds form stars. Some, star, uh, some clouds form stars and others don't. Um, and perhaps we're going to talk more about that. But when, when they become gravitationally unstable, they, they form pre-stellar cores, which later become pre-stellar objects. And when, when the matter collapses onto itself, it conserves what is called angular momentum. If it's rotating a little bit, uh, that amount of rotation, if you like, is, is, is conserved during the collapse. It's like one of these figure ice skaters who puts her arms in and spins up, and that's exactly what happens. So the matter around the pre-stellar core, the, the, the protostar, becomes a disk around the star. And uh, this disk, uh, uh, in this disk, uh, uh, the process of planetary formation takes place. So that's the very short version of, uh, of, of how a planetary system uh, comes into being. Now, when we were trying as scientists to put together this this idea of this understanding of how planets formed we we couldn't exactly sit and watch the entire process from start to finish but rather we've had to use a myriad of different telescopes to look at star formation all over the sky and capture snapshots of different systems in different ages. It's kind of like going to the shopping mall to understand a human life. You see the moms pushing their little kids in baskets and the elderly people out for a walk in the evening. And you can catch all the stages of human from little kids to elderly person by watching the folks in the mall. Um, what we as astronomers do is we sit here on Earth and watch the stars and capture the moments of childhood and senior citizens and everything in between. Um, with humans, though, we can just use our eyes, but with astronomy, it's a little bit trickier. We, we need to use uh, a bunch of different telescopes that work in different ways, and Herschel's one of these telescopes that works in a different way. It works in um, the infrared, a color of light that is redder than anything that we can see with our eyes. Uh, what is it that the infrared telescope, the infrared light Herschel observes, let you see that we couldn't otherwise see? Okay, so I like very much your picture about how we can understand how, what stars are, how they form, and so on. But just like there is a, a part of the process of how human forms that we don't see out in the shopping mall, that's also true about the stars. We don't see the whole story. Um, and it turns out that the most interesting part of the story for how a star actually comes into being, we cannot see in, in the visible light. So it's like it happens somewhere where we don't have access. And, and this somewhere is in, in these clouds that I described before. So there is no light coming out of these stars. And, and, and one reason is that there is simply is no light inside them at the beginning before the star formation has happened. But even when stars form, in the beginning we don't see very much because the, the light simply cannot come out. But the forming stars, they heat up their surroundings. And anything which has a temperature emits, that is we learned in school. And depending on the temperature of what is emitting, uh, the, 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 the emission that comes out has different wavelengths. Now, I said that the most interesting is, is taking place inside these clouds. I said that these clouds are very cold. That means that the, the emission that comes out has very long wavelengths, so the far infrared. And Herschel was built to observe the universe in the far infrared. So what we can see with Herschel, you could call it to see that we are seeing heat from very cold objects. But you can also call it light because it's the same thing. It's just the wavelength which is different. But heat is what people normally call infrared light. So we can, we can observe heat from structures that are only a couple of tens of degrees warm, if you want to use the word warm. 
uh, above above the absolute zero. So we we can see what happens inside these clouds from which no light can escape. And and the images are are truly amazing. I'm gonna work to bring up some of them now. Um, so so this is one of the Cygnus X region uh, that is is one of my favorites. It really looks like a modern art painting, but this is an image of of what you were able to see with with Herschel. Uh, this is uh, within Vela. Uh, this is within the ever so uh, oddly named IC51460801411. Um, and this is part of the Dark Heart Nebula. As, as we look at, at these different images, um, we are able to see, thanks to Herschel, some of the earliest moments of star formation. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the structures, the filamentary structures that, that are seen in these images? Sure. Um, there are two images in particular of, of the ones you showed that I think are, are interesting for us. If Can can you show the other one, the IC5, uh, uh, whatever the number is again? Yes. Again? Okay, yeah. it's up on you, the screen. I think you can see quite clearly just using your eyes. Uh, to, to the right in the picture, you kind of see filaments, which are a little bit brighter uh, uh, and going more or less horizontal in, 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 in the image. And you can also see uh, uh, some, some bright knots in some places in these filaments. Now, if you go to the Vela C image, which you had before, here you can see, here, you, here it may be that to the eye, the, the kind of filaments may not be so obvious, but what is obvious in this image is all the little white uh, white dot knots that you can see. Now, what do we actually see here? Because we are seeing images in light which we cannot see. There are hundreds of times longer wavelengths than, than the light we can see with our eyes. What we actually see here is emission, call it heat if you like, infrared emission from dust, which I told you before, it's only a small fraction of, of the mass in, 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 in the cloud. What we're interested in is, is, is the gas, actually, but we can't see the gas, so we use the dust as a tracer for the gas. So what you see here is dust emission, and the, 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 the whiter, the whiter uh, it is in this picture, the warmer it is, and the redder it is, the colder it is. So you can see that, that uh, there is a lot of structure in this cloud. There is a lot of things going on in this cloud and in particular you can see all these bright white little dots in, in, in various places in, in, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in, in this cloud and these are stars that are, are forming. You, you wouldn't see anything at all if you looked at this in light. We have a couple of such pictures too where you can compare light and, and the far infrared light and, and basically this is just black in light. And so what we're seeing here is looking inside the cloud to see what's going on and what we are what we are what we are witnessing is is the birth of a of a, of a large number of stars in in these particular regions here, and if you look more carefully, you will see that they are not forming uniformly in this cloud, but they are forming along what has become to be called filaments, which have been uh, observed in great detail with with Herschel, and these are kind of long threads of of material in the cloud where the density is higher than than the average density. And what we have discovered with Herschel is that if you have a density which is above a certain threshold, these filaments tend to produce stars. And if the density is not high enough, then you simply don't get stars. So there are clouds where you have filaments, but no forming stars. And, 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 and this is actually uh, um, an answer to a question which people have worried about a, a lot before. And that is, why do some clouds form stars and others do not? And with Herschel, we, have, we see very clearly that there seems to be a, a threshold in the density in these filaments that we can see in the clouds that tells us whether a particular cloud is forming stars or not. And this, this also gets at the, the idea that while everything started out as clouds of dust and gas, uh, mostly gas, dust took time, um, 
over time, small density differences, small places that had a little bit more matter than others, were able to gravitationally collapse in. Other places, things were, for long periods of time, completely stable. You had gas pressure inside the cloud that was, in general, able to support the cloud against gravity. But things happen that can cause clouds to collapse, that can increase, enhance the density. Uh, our, our galaxy is very much a dynamic place, where as these molecular clouds get shocked by supernovae, as they pass through the high density regions of the arms of the galaxy, all of these different things can affect the clouds. And uh, what 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 aspects of this have, have you focused on? So, so indeed, uh, the clouds have a certain lifetime. So, so gas in a galaxy can be in, in different phases. It can be hot and tenuous at the one end, and it can be uh, cold and molecular at the other end. Now, if, you, if you're interested in star formation, then it's obviously the cold molecular gas which is what you're interested in. And and uh, and uh, so, so this has this is uh, one of the areas where we really have been concentrating a lot of uh, Herschel observing time on, because uh, the question of star formation is uh, is really very central to 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 what is going on in a galaxy. After all, a galaxy is a collection of stars. Having said that, only only a small fraction of the total mass of a galaxy actually is in the form of stars. But the stars, are, are, I think, speaks to the mind of everybody because everybody has been standing on a, on a cold winter night, at least if you come from the northern hemisphere. Months of the year. Uh, this is true, this is true, this is true. Um, and, and so everybody knows the concept of a star and, and at least when I was a child, not everybody was aware that every star is a sun. I think m people are more aware of that now. And now we also know that a lot, basically, more or less, uh, probably uh, around almost all these stars that we can see, all these suns that we can see in the night sky, there are also other planetary systems. So, so the formation of stars is, is, is really very, very interesting and also very important if we want to know, come back to the question that you asked at the beginning, where, you know, how, how did we come about? And, you know, the, the starting point is we need a planet to come about to, to, to you know, to produce us. And you need to form stars in order to produce planets. So that, that's been really one of the very important uh, observing programs for, for many of the people who have used Herschel. Now, now with Herschel, you on one hand got at the earliest moments of what led to planetary formation, the filaments, the star, form, star system formation. Um, but you've also explored the far other side, the planetary disk uh, processes around early stars. Um, can you give us some highlights of what's been found as, as Herschel's looked at these uh, protoplanetary disks? Yeah, so what, what we have done is we, we have tried to form, uh, so, sorry, to follow um, the whole uh, sequence from the formation of, of, of clumps in molecular clouds to to protostars, to, to young stars, and to really stars with, with planetary system. We cannot see planets with, with, with Herschel because they're too small, um, but we, we, we can see disks around stars, and we can, we can, we can observe them in two different ways. Um, we can observe them in, in their dust emission, as I explained a little moment ago, but you can also actually see um, gas directly although you have to look at the uh, gases which are uh, uh, not so common, like carbon monoxide and other gases. You cannot see the hydrogen right away. So, in, so one of the interesting aspects is what is the lifetime of these protoplanetary disks around stars? Because the general feeling is that what makes such a disk to disappear? And, and uh, the, the general, the, the simple answer is, well, if you form planets, they're going to use up some of the material and get rid of the rest somehow. Um, and uh, so it's interesting to be able to say something about what is the lifetime of, 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 of these disks. So we have been studying disks both in dust and in, 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 in gas emission uh, quite extensively. And 
what what's amazing is how fast this process can be. Um, our our universe has been around for roughly 13.8 billion years, and they keep adding accuracy to that decimal place every year. Um, and we're still seeing star formation. Um, we have some ideas on what causes some of the, the clouds to collapse, but in general, um, how is it that we still have star formation going on even though this is such a fast process? Yeah, it turns out, it turns out that in, in some sense, star formation is rather inefficient. So when you form stars in a cloud, then only a fraction of, of, of the gas in the cloud actually end up in the form of stars. So that's on, on, on the cloud scale, if you like. Now if you, and perhaps this is going a little bit outside what we're doing in this, 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 this uh, hangout, but it's also the fact that there's lots of, of, of gas between the galaxies. And the galaxies gravitationally attract new gas from the intergalactic, not the interstellar, but the intergalactic medium, and they feed themselves with, with new gas. And, and especially in the younger universe, star formation uh, uh, was more violent, was, was going on at, the, at a greater rate, simply because there was more raw material, there were more gas around. Um, and, uh, but that is self-destructive in a certain sense. When, when, when you form ga uh, uh, lots of stars in, in, a, in, in, a, in, in, in a violent manner, then some of the gas is expelled from, 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 from the center of the galaxy where, or, or from wherever this uh, star formation is taking place. So star formation is inherently inefficient and also, when it's very um, energetic, self-destructive. So not all gas becomes stars right away, but it takes time. But having said that, our galaxy today, at the age that you mentioned, you know, almost 14 billion years after, after the uh, Big Bang, is forming like one solar mass of matter stars per year. So like one sun, although most stars are smaller than the sun, so a couple of small stars per year on the average is what is being formed in our Milky Way now. Now, 10 billion years ago, that was 100 times more in a normal galaxy. So the star formation rate is going down in the universe. We are still forming stars because there's still some matter left. And, and one of the things that you touched on is these energetic processes actually allow the light to, in some ways, overcome gravity because uh, very young stars and, in fact, in, in many of the most energetically star-forming galaxies, you also have active um, uh, disks in the center of the stars uh, that are piling matter in towards a central supermassive black hole. And this phenomenon, which is uh, often referred to as a quasar or an active galactic nuclei, um, this highly energetic process in the center of these young galaxies gives off so much light that it pushes matter out of the centers of the galaxies. Exact same physics is at play with really young stars that once they get going, once they turn on, they start giving off so much light that they push out matter that's trying to fall onto the star. So all of these different processes have this almost regulatory valve on them where when things get too energetic all of that light just pushes away the matter that's trying to gravitationally full, fall onto the system. So you have this balancing act that has to take place where for things to form gravity has to win. For things to stop light has to win. And in between you have this balancing between light and gravity. Now all of these things are actually things that have finally been sorted out actually since I started studying astronomy when I was a kid. Um, I remember people putting up slides of, of uh, things like star forming regions and active galactic nuclei and writing words like here be monsters and we don't know if there's planets and now we know these answers. Your career has, has spanned even more remarkable discoveries. What is perhaps the most amazing thing that um, has impacted your way of viewing our universe that's been discovered in your career? 
Well, it's a difficult one, but if you just take, if you're asking for the moment, then one thing that we saw when we turned Herschel on and we made the very first uh, first observations of, of the sky, and uh, and uh, so we, we have three instruments on, on Herschel, and the instrument which uh, looks at the longest wavelengths, the, the coldest regions, if you like, um, is, is called Spire. And when, 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 when we took the first images with Spire, we, uh, we were actually imaging a couple of nearby galaxies, you know, the typical galaxy that looks nice with spirals and what have you. And uh, so you get an image with a spiral galaxy on it, but it looks like it was in a snowstorm. You know, there were kind of white dots everywhere. Yeah. And what's gone wrong, you know? What's, what, what is happening here? Until it dawned upon everybody. Those snowflakes are just distant galaxies. Oh, that's amazing. We wanted to image a nearby galaxy to check that everything is working. And here we get the distant universe right out of the box, just like that. And, of course, this could have been predicted, but nobody kind of did that. And, and so when, when we just saw it, it took some time to understand that. And then it dawned upon us, yes, we do see the nearby galaxy. Yes, we see galaxies whose light has been traveling for 10 giga years to reach us, just like that. And that, was, that, that, that was an unreal feeling. That, that must have been amazing to have been part of building this and having looked so forward to it and to try and do something so simple and inadvertently. You, you basically got photobombed by the high redshift universe. It and was just there. <laughs> that's absolutely amazing. Um, what, what a remarkable moment to have. Do you still have that photo anywhere? Oh my God! Um, somewhere, yes, but it would take me a little while to to find it. It it it's fine. Uh, if you could possibly email it to me so that I could share it with with sure. our viewers, I I deeply appreciate it. Um, so so this is has been an amazing discussion, um, hitting on how this is still very much. Uh, something that we're still working to understand. Star formation and planet formation are not solved problems. There's still lots of room for new science to be done, and you're part of doing that new science. Um, before moving on to overview the details of our educational scenario, do you have any parting words that you'd like to leave our audience with uh, about your work in science? Well, I think... So my interest is, has been in, in, in star formation. Herschel as an observatory is no longer operational. Uh, we made our last observation in 2013. We are still working on, 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 on making our data into data products which, uh, which uh, people can use in the best possible way because Herschel will continue producing science for many years uh, from now. Um, I'm now working a little part of my time on a future mission which is uh, going to look for uh, planets around other stars. It's called PLATO. Um, and the, the connection between star formation and looking for planets is how planets form. And I think that means that you want to study these disks that we talked about earlier. And, and in order to, to study these disks, you simply need to have sharper eyes than we had with Herschel. And in, an op any optical instruments has, has a, a resolution, as we call it, how sharp you can see, which is the wavelength divided by the size of the, in, of, of the aperture of the instrument. And because we were looking at very long wavelengths, we could not see so sharp. Uh, but the way, the way to deal with that is to pick very, very big instruments, which we will never afford, well, not in our lifetime at least, to send out into space. But you can look at slightly longer wavelengths than what Herschel did, and you can do it from the ground, and here, here we now have a big interferometer on the ground called, called ALMA. That, um, um, if you're interested in how planets form, I think watch this space in, in the coming five, five, five years, what, what ALMA is, go, is, is going to do. So if, 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 if that is really what you're interested in, this is, I, I, I would say, is what you, what, what, what you want to look at. Now... I one more thing, which I think is, is, is of great interest to many people, 
although most people probably never worried about it, and that is we, we look at Earth, but some people say, and if you've seen the pictures from the space station, for instance, or anything like that, um, your picture is away now. Ah, yes, this is an Alma picture of a disk around a star. And, and, and you can possibly, although we don't know that for sure, but you can visualize these gaps that you see in, in the disk may have been for, uh, uh, caused by, uh, by, by planetary bodies forming there. So in, the, in what I was coming to on our Earth, we have lots of water. And we actually are not, it's a, it's a very big debate, and I was very surprised about this because this is not my area. People actually debate, and there are big conferences in, in nice places about where does the water come from. Now, something we have done with Herschel is that we have followed the water from its formation in molecular clouds through the pre-stellar objects to the disks and in our own solar system. Herschel has observed water in our own solar system in places like Ceres, uh, uh, Taurus around Saturn, and perhaps the most, uh, most uh, surprising at all, probably in the Kuiper Belt as well and in several comets. And so Herschel has been able to form, to follow water from its formation in molecular clouds all into our own solar system and has also kind of kept the debate going about where our own water is coming from because this we still don't know. Yeah, I th this is something actually that came up during our uh, Icy Bodies Hangout, the, the problem with the type of water that you find in uh, Shirigiri 67P, the, the comet that Rosetta is currently orbiting alongside, uh, isn't the same type of water that we have here on Earth, but Comet Hartley does have the same kind of water. That's but, right. But there's this confusion of even one CP67P type comet hitting Earth would change our water dramatically. So this is a real confusing point where Herschel got us all the way up to where we're now confused and this is why we need to keep looking and keep doing science. Absolutely, absolutely. So so it's been absolutely fabulous having you on uh, and I, I look forward to getting um, that image from you if you can find it of, of what it was like to turn on Herschel and see the background universe photobombing your image. Um, and uh, I thank you so much for taking a bit out of your day to join us and our audience. Before I let you go, we do have one question that came in from Peter Waldman. Uh, he asks, how do binary star systems form and are there protoplanetary disks always in one plane? Um, if, if you have a fa fast answer to that, if you have to go, I understand, and I'll take on the question, but I, I'd love to hear your quick take on binary systems. No, it's a, it's, it, it's a good comment. I mean, it's, it's, it's easier to discuss the formation of one star with a disk around it. Um, now, with binary, we, we, but we know that many stars, perhaps even the majority of stars, are in binary systems or even triple systems. And, and uh, <clears throat> here, what uh, and, and we, we have seen planets around stars, about also around binary stars, and, and, and you have different uh, different situations depending on the distance between the stars. You have binary systems where the stars are very far away from each other, so that in principle they could both have their own disk, if you like. I'm not aware of having seen a disk around a, a binary system where the stars are very close to each other. But I think they must exist simply because we know about systems where we have planets that orbit around both of, of the stars in binary systems. And, and it starts to all come down to uh, the separation between the stars. If, if the stars are snuggled up right next to one another, then they do seem to, to share common angular momentum, common disks, common planetary orbits around them. Um, as they're farther apart, they, they in general seem to have similar uh, rotations, and the same is true with galaxies that, that form next to one another. Things like to collapse in one set of rotation and then fragment as they're going. Um, but 
the universe keeps surprising us with all of the exceptions to all of the rules. So while we can say we've seen many things that appear the same, uh, there's always going to be that exception that proves us wrong on our, our universal ideas. So any last words to add before I let you go on with the rest of your evening? No, no. Uh, thank you for inviting me and, uh, and I hope uh, some people have been able to share in the uh, in the fantastic story of understanding how uh, how stars form and how our own how our planet has formed once. Well, I I can see that we have a pretty good sized audience out there viewing right now, and uh, hopefully this will just get seen more as it goes out into the archives. So those of you watching, please share out what we're doing and help get more people involved in understanding. Uh, the scientific understanding of where it is that our world came from. Thank you so much for joining me. This this has really been a pleasure, um, and uh, I I hope our paths cross again. Thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you. So, uh, following on the footsteps of that fabulous interview. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time going over how you as educators, uh, education public outreach specialists, can take these ideas and make them understandable for um, your audiences. And one of my personal favorite things to do is to go outside on a clear, uh, for me in the northern hemisphere, a clear winter's night. And for the most part, this works wherever you are um, in the mid latitudes on the planet, because I'm talking about objects that can be seen from pretty much everywhere. So go outside roughly September through March and look up. And as you look up, what you can see is the constellation Orion. Um, Orion is is one of my favorite systems, um, and and to hang up and escape this this hangout, click the little red hangout button at the top of this window if you mouse over this window. Um, so so go out on on a night sometime between uh, September and March, October and March. Look up and find the constellation Orion, and within the sword of Orion is this beautiful, not this beautiful to your eyes, but this beautiful nebula that we call the Orion Nebula. Uh, this is also called Messier 42. And this is a fairly young region that is undergoing star formation. Um, and this is part of what we have built into the exercise I'm going to talk to you about today. So you can orient your students on what star forming is with this idea and start to introduce to them the notion that star formation is something that we can see going outside tonight and looking up. And when they go outside, what they can't see um, at all is that these star forming regions are, are littered with uh, cocoons of, of regions that we can see with the Hubble Space Telescope that uh, we refer to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the image and it turns out I can't effectively talk and open files at the same time. Um, we find these little uh, nuggets called uh, either proplids or proto stars uh, depending on what you're reading. And so in the lesson plan that we've put together, we get you first starting off by familiarizing your students with these ideas of there is star formation going on. Um, there are these small yet visible places in the sky where we can see these infant star systems in the process of going. And you can familiarize them with all of the words. Now to make this easier, we have put together a lesson plan that is available through the Inspiring Science Education Portal. So to get to it, you go to portal.opendiscoveryspace.eu, um, log in, and search the communities for the star and planet formation community. And when you get there, this is what you see. And under the resources, 
we have a new resource that um, we we are releasing today, and this new resource is uh, our star and planet formation lesson plan. Um, we have added into this lesson plan both uh, a teacher's guide and a student worksheet set. So when you're looking at the teacher resources, it gives you uh, background information that you can read up here at the top of it, and then it goes through all of this vocabulary that I was telling you about. Um, the vocabulary of how we discuss formation. And it then encourages you to get your students discussing um, what it is that, that's happening, the filaments that are forming, the high density regions that are collapsing, all of these different things. And understanding that everyone likes, te likes um, to have amazing pictures to look at, we've given you uh, a bunch of different uh, press releases with amazing images, uh, largely from the Hubble Space Telescope, that you can bring into your classroom as here's what it looks like with the most amazing telescopes we have. Um, and we go through all the way from the filaments that we discussed today to the eggs emerging, these are the proplids that I just showed you a picture of, to the dust pillars of Carina, all of these different parts we present all the way up through, in fact, to how dust molecules in solar systems go on to become um, well, planetoids, asteroids, and all the way up through planets. Now, to help you get your students to understand this, we have an activity. And rather than simply showing you a bunch of words, I'm now going to turn off my screen share and talk to you. So the idea with this activity is you take index cards, pieces of paper, whatever it is that you have, and you start out by counting up your students. Um, and writing for the same number that you have students on each of these cards the word dust. Hand each of them a dust card and then go someplace large. Go to your gymnasium, go to a cafeteria that has all of the tables out of the way. Go outside if the weather lets you go outside. This is an awesome activity to do if you have a, a large square or um, a, a football field of some sort to work on. And tell the students that what you're going to have them do is play the role of dust in the early solar system. And they're going to do this in one band of our solar system. So one of those stripy bits that was still there in the image I showed you from Alma. And set them running and tell them if they're able to tag somebody else and to do this safely, no harm. If, if, if we want everyone to survive, the dust did sur survive to the modern day. Um, when they tag somebody, those two people now can link arms and those are two dust molecules that have merged into something larger. Now, as those two linked dust molecules are now running, they can grab other people. Do this for a couple of minutes in, until you see that you've had many of these dust molecules bond together to form larger and larger systems. Now, the next set of cards you're going to have is the co conjules cards. These are for these small minerals that we see inside of meteorites that we're able to collect here on Earth and take into the lab. These are uh, formed out of dust particles that collided, melted together, collided with others, and grew into these beautiful structures. Give the groups of 4 to 10 uh, conjule cards. Um, so now you have larger groups. Let them run some more. These conjules can then grab onto more people. And as they go, you can stop and restart and upgrade the cards until eventually what you'll find is you have one or two asteroids and we document how many people it takes to form an asteroid in the exercise that's available through Inspiring Science Education. You'll have a couple of asteroids, a bunch of leftover dust that is now on the other side of the sun, which is probably you standing in the center of all of this. And um, a few leftover conjoles floating about. But it's really a good way to get the kids to understand why there's leftover dust, why asteroids come in different sizes. And there's a series of discussion questions that we have put together to help you getting your kids um, thinking about what this wild running around activity, which is great for uh, 
one of those spring days when your kids don't want to be working inside anyways, um, really get them understanding the science. Now, the goal with Inspiring Science Education is to get students learning through inquiry. And while running around is great, and this gives them a good understanding of what's going on, um, it's also good to get them looking at the data. So the main activity that we have in this actually has them going back and thinking more about that star forming system, M42, that I started telling you about a few moments ago. And then also has them looking at a variety of other activities, um, not activities, other regions in the sky that are different ages. So to set the stage, Tell your students that, that star formation is a process where you start with these giant molecular clouds and they fragment and form stars and you're left with these beautiful, well, the science doesn't dictate the beauty, that's the human mind. What you're left with is a spheroid of young stars that all formed at about the same amount of time. Now while this gas cloud was happily held together by gravity, we now have a bunch of discrete stars. Some are a little closer to the center of the galaxy, some are a little further away. And these differences in distance from the center of the galaxy, these differences in distance between the individual stars, I mean, some of these stars, like Mercury, are going to orbit a whole lot faster. Um, so if you think about it, Mercury orbits faster around the Sun than Venus, um, and that's because of different distances from the Sun. Now some of these stars are going to orbit slower, just like Pluto out in the outskirts of our solar system doing its dwarf planet thing orbits very, very slow. Um, over time, this is going to cause changes to how this cluster of young stars looks. And this is where you get your, st your kids trying to first build a hypothesis of what do they expect they'll see. Here we have Orion at 3 million years old. Then we have the starburst cluster, NGC 3603. It's 5 million years old. Then we have the Pleiades system, which can also be seen at the same time that you can see Orion. It's 115 million years old. And finally, here's the Hyades cluster, also visible alongside the Pleiades and Orion. The Hyades cluster is 625 million years old. So you have these progressively older and older systems. Introduce your students to the idea that they'll be given software. Um, in this case, we're going to have them using Stellarium to measure the angular size of these clusters on the sky. And images that are all taken the same way. We're using digital sky survey images that are available through Skyview Virtual Observatory and they can open these images in Salsa J and get at, well, how does the separation in stars change over time? We give the students the distance to each cluster, and if you have the angular size of the cluster, and you know how far away from you that object is, you can use the skinny angle or the skinny triangle small angle approximation to get at the physical size. So now you're bringing in mass. You bring we have a little tiny angle that these things subtend on the sky. We measure the distance to them via methods the students don't need at this point. We're just going to give them the distance today. And they can calculate the physical size. They can then go in, um, measure the uh, separations between stars and see how those typical separations change over time, calculate how the measured separations on the image so now you have pixel space, can convert to angular distances on the sky. This is why we have to measure the angle in one piece of software and the measurements of the individual stars in another piece. We've, to make this possible, prepared for you a spreadsheet template where the students plug everything into the spreadsheet and it allows them to see step by step what needs to happen. It teaches them spreadsheet skills, teaches them inquiry, and hopefully gets them thinking about how it is we understand everything we understand. Now, all of this, as I said, is available to you through Inspiring Science Education. And all of the activities that we've so far had them do are things that are based on our current understanding. 
of, of the universe and it's a current understanding uh, that has been around for tens of years, uh, probably longer than that in some cases. As we get them working towards the end of this project, we want to dangle in front of them the fact that there are still things left to discover. Yes, we understand dust collides, forms planets. We've known that for a long time. Take a meteorite, cut it open, put it under a microscope. School kids get to do this. You see the chondrules. We understand these bits. Look at the sky. You can see these different clusters. But what about our own sun? It formed in one of these clusters. Where did its siblings go? This is something that until very recently we didn't think we'd ever be able to understand. But a joint American-German team recently was able to find, while studying exoplanets, a star that appears to be the same age as the Sun, is made of the exact same material as our Sun, and has an orbit consistent with having formed alongside our Sun. And so as we close this activity, we encourage you to have your students think about the fact that, well, the oldest of the star clusters they looked at in the inquiry activity it was 625 million years old, but we live in a solar system that's five and a half billion years old. So if star systems drift apart, where are sun siblings? How do you find them? Have this discussion with them and then introduce this new piece of science less than a year old and get them realizing there are still things out there for them to discover. So this is this is what we've put together for you. Um, and I see that we have a question from Patrick Calhoun who asks, uh, with your research on stars um, forming in clouds, will we be able to recreate how stars formed in the cloud? Um, and do we have graphics already? Um, so we do have folks that are out there trying to model what's seen in star forming regions, trying to build software that allows us to see in the software snapshots of going from filaments through to cores heating up through to stars turning on, the changes in accretion that go on as that light pressure comes into play. And what scientists often do because we love the pretty Hubble pictures and we love playing with our computers is we'll take these models and we'll rotate them and we'll change the mass and we'll change the information to recreate various things that we see on the sky so that we can show the model rotated to the correct orientation side by side with what we see with Hubble, Spitzer, Herschel and we can see model versus data and show that what we're creating in our computers does actually recreate uh, what we see in the universe. We're not quite yet to the point of saying, okay, so we know the Orion Nebula has this composition and this mass. Let's start from ground zero and recreate Orion Nebula in our computer. We can't recreate M42, but we can recreate pieces of the picture. Um, so that's what I had prepared to for you today. I do have a couple of brief announcements. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find the window the announcements landed in. Um, so in, in a couple of weeks, we're coming up on a couple of interesting moments in time. First of all, for those of you who uh, write dates the way we do here in America, month, day, year, we're coming up on Pi Day, 3.1415 this year for 2015. Um, this is a pretty neat thing to point to your kids uh, just because it's silly and fun. Um, we're also uh, moving up on a solar eclipse that will be visible in Europe. And along with all of this is um, a global project to try and get school groups around the world recreating the experiment that allowed us to understand, uh, well not us, but allowed our ancestors thousands of years ago to understand exactly how large the Earth is. So on March 19th and 20th there will be an experiment, um, the uh, Erasthenes experiment, where we're asking school groups to go out and um, use a stick to measure at noon when the sun is straight overhead how far to the north or south of straight overhead um, the sun is. And by measuring these points all along the north-south part of the planet and knowing across the surface of the planet 
how far apart those places are, we can actually get at the diameter of the Earth. Um, the angle of the Sun reflects the angle from the core to the surface of the planet between those two points. So if you know the distance across that part of the sphere, you know the angle due to the shadow of the Sun measured with the Sun straight on that north-south line. Um, it's just maths and it gives you the size of the planet. You can learn more about this at erastonines.ea.gr that's E-R-A-T-O-S-T-H-E-N-E-S dot -E E-A dot -E G-R. I will be putting that link in the Google event page for this Hangout as well as in the YouTube show notes. Um, so these are the things that's coming up. Our next event is going to be, as always, second Tuesday. Uh, so I will be seeing you next in April. You can go and you can find our next Hangout already scheduled on our Google Plus page. Uh, so just search for Inspiring Science Education Hangouts in Google Plus. And um, what you'll find is, um, actually, sorry, I lied. Our next event is March 25th. Uh, we, this is one of those magical months with two Hangouts. Uh, on March 25th, we have Star and Energy Transport. Uh, that will be at the same time as this Hangout if you're in Europe. Um, and uh, other parts of the world are undergoing uh, various time zone changes. So if you're outside of Europe, I would encourage you to go to the Google page and find out what time it is because Google will automatically convert the times. Um, so tune in on March 25th for our Star and Energy Transport Hangout. Then again on April 8th, we will do Gas Laws and Star and Nebula. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all then and if you have any questions leave them in the hangout and we'll see about getting to answer them in our show notes. So thank you for joining me, thank you audience um, and I have one final note popping in. I'm being asked uh, to remind everyone that the Erastonines activity requires schools to register um, before March 12th. So the clock is ticking. You have 24 hours from this live event to go ahead and register uh, your school's involvement. So go check that out and thanks for joining us and I'll see you next time on the Inspiring Science Education Hangouts. Thank you. <laughs>